Hey everybody, Bob Hamer, Sports Business Solutions and the Clubhouse. Uh, thanks for tuning into this this webinar. Uh, we had three very special guests. It was, uh, it was myself and uh, Eric Hewson, um, my partner in crime on the on the mental health uh, series that we've been doing in sports business. Um, same here, Solutions. And then we also had two uh, other guests. We had Mark uh, Stitcherbina, who actually played rugby in Australia and went through an injury and he talks about how he overcame that uh, and then we also have Natalie Pierre who's joined us who was a rising uh, sports uh, journalist and then had some incredible adversity in her life Talk, she talks about her suicide attempts and she talks about how she was burned all over her body and how she came through that and some of the things that she's doing now so it's, a, it's an incredible discussion around loss it's super raw um, very inspirational and hope you hope you enjoy it thanks for tuning in Um, you know, as I mentioned before, I went through a few of the feel, I guess there were feelings that sense of and what I lost and how I lost it. So the loss of belonging, the loss of um, significance, the loss of uh, a, a lot of those things. And I, that leads me into what I started doing to, to Bob's question. It all comes down to self-awareness. And that's why I do what I do. And I call it winning EQ as in emotional intelligence, emotional quotient. I started, I embarked on a personal growth journey of self-awareness. And, and that is one main thing that I just want to encourage everybody to lean into is understanding who you are, the emotions that come up, how to describe those emotions and feelings, and then you can learn how to shift or move through them and start to change your perspective. So as Bob mentioned, being able to come out of it. So that's where I'll start is self-awareness is key and it's huge. And for me, it really started with reading a book called The Power of Now. So that was a tool that I used and it was given to me from a, a teammate of mine who could see what I was in. He could see what I couldn't see. So it took for him to make it known, this is how you're being right now and it's not serving you and Here's a book that might help you because I think this is going to bring you to the present moment. So it was, it started with that book and just to give me some clarity and really have me get honest with myself and not be scared of it, not be afraid. Just say, okay, this is what's happening. These are these feelings. I'm anxious. I'm scared. Uh, I kept thinking about what I've lost and that was my career. And to Natalie's point before about the identity and this is what I've come to learn through self-awareness and personal growth is I started to shift my understanding of my, it being my identity as a rugby player and understanding it more as it's what I identified with. So if we can make that distinction of, yes, we identify with it because we, we get in the habit of doing that thing every day and get good at it and we get the benefits from it. So we are identifying with it, but that's not necessarily our identity. And I think that alleviated a lot of uh, anxiety in myself and being able to move forward is once I made that distinction for myself, this isn't who I am. This is what I did or do. And I can do so many other things. So that was, that's what I'd say was the first thing that kind of put me on the right path to getting through and being able to handle. And it comes up from time. I still have emotions. I still have feelings. Uh, that don't serve me and it's a constant practice but thankfully I got put on that path and got really excited about learning about myself and growing that it just pushes me to want to learn more and go to workshops and read more books and it just gives me more control and that's another thing that I felt I lacked was control control over my environment control over what was next and I learned to have a better relationship with my ego because the power of now taught me that a lot of this anxiety and a lot of these thoughts that are coming up for me is my ego. So once I kind of had some understanding of my relationship with my ego and that it was that that was causing a lot of the thoughts and feelings, then I can better control that and move through it so that I'm not having those thoughts and feelings. So it was really acceptance was, was the big one for me. Uh, and that's accepting 
my new situation, which was no longer playing rugby. And I just want to say also what I've learned since then as well, and a lot of my coaching is being mindful of our language. And I love the topic because we can really identify with loss. It's what's happening right now. But changing our language is, a, is another great tool. And being mindful of the language that we use and the feelings that get brought up because you know our world our words create our world so even the word loss can be substituted for maybe change or even release so when we think of releasing something i've just got this vision of fishing right you catch a fish and there's the exhilaration of that if you're not going to go home and eat it or whatever and you release it there's almost like a feel-good feeling of releasing that i haven't lost that fish i'm releasing it and what if we could use that same language around losing a job, losing a partner. I know it's, and I don't want to be insensitive with loss of loved ones. And that's a part of life when we lose them. But perhaps we could even look at that as releasing them as well. There's just this feeling by using that word that it's going to a better place and allows us to move forward to something new and something better. So I, um, th that's, that's the start, I think, of, of my journey. And there's so much more I can go into, into the steps, but definitely learning about acceptance. The last thing I would say about acceptance and that process, because it's easier said than done, I understand that, is perspective. We hear about it all the time, but actually practicing shifting our perspective and that there, there are a lot worse things that could happen to me right now and, and are happening to other people and then being grateful for what I have. We tend to get caught up in what we've lost, start moving toward and focusing on what we still have and what we're grateful for. I, yeah, Mark, I love that, Mark. And, and yeah. I'm glad that, um, I'm glad that you, know, you, you ended on perspective there because I know a big piece of Natalie's uh, a story is that change in perspective. And, and we were even joking a little bit about last night Natalie, I, I don't know if you want to turn your video on as you talk, but, um, you know, I, I, I hope you don't mind being a little bit vulnerable with this, but you were talking a little bit about the aesthetics of being in, in, in you know, a female in the sports industry and how you're treated differently now versus you, 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 are, you are treated then. And almost what you might, to, to Mark's point, what you've gained from the changes that have happened and not looking at it like it's, this loss, but looking at it almost like the loss ended up with a gain as well. Yeah, no, I think a lot of just from what Mark said, though, even though, you know, as Eric has mentioned a couple of times, our stories are so different of, of what we've lost and, and how we've lost it. I think a lot of the things that we struggled with was the same and that anxiety and that, that loss of identity. But yeah, no, I think for me, you know, five years ago, when you, over 85% of my body was burned. And so, you know, while I was never someone that saw like my looks as anything significant, I never used them or never um, even, I mean, I'm a horrible dresser. I'm a horrible, it's not something I played to. So for me, <laughs> while, you know, it, it gives you that perspective of, wow, people treat you differently when you've got this, uh, you know, traditionally, people thinking, oh, you're like a really beautiful woman to now saying, oh, like something happened to her, like what's wrong? And, and so for me, one of the things that I was telling Eric was just, you know, I see so much strength and power in, you know, my scars instead of saying, wow, I lost my looks and all of these things that maybe allowed people to treat me differently, even though that wasn't something I asked for or wanted you know, I, it allows me my scars. It allows me to start a conversation. I probably every single day or week, um, maybe less so now because I leave the house less now. But whenever I go out, the grocery store, wherever it is, a restaurant, you know, people will ask me, you know, what happened? And then I, I share my story. And in doing that, it allows other people to be vulnerable and share their story. And so, you know, for me, I, I try to, you know, perspective is beautiful. And I try to use that perspective of, you know, I, you know, I'm thankful, number one, that I never became overly or never was overly obsessed with how I looked. Um, so it's made it an easier transition for me. Um, but honestly, for me, the most difficult part wasn't 
you know, how I look. Like I have, you know, I have a thumb now. And so that's, that's different. But for me, it was really, um, th like uh, Mark said, acceptance. So acceptance of, you know, this wasn't, if, if I had been burned um, going and doing something heroic, I think that would have been easier for me to accept. But it was a little bit more difficult for me to accept that um, because, I, you know, initially you go out and you have shame. And so working through that, and that's really allowed me to get to my point where I'm at now is, is owning my story, owning the things that I have been through, the person I was, and the evolution, evolution of me. I, you know, am someone that, like I said, I define myself entirely by my career, but now I'm multifaceted. I, I've spent more time just getting to learn myself. And I think, you know, when we're someone, I'm somebody that's very ambitious, OCD, very obsessive personality, you know, I like to be in control, but I think something about being uncomfortable and, and being out of control and having to take that time to learn about, um, you know, who you are without this thing that you've seen yourself as for your entire life and never imagined yourself as um, being anything else. It, you know, when you add more to who you are, it actually gives more to what you're able to give to your craft. So I'm a better storyteller, a better journalist, a better, you know, CEO of a company because I am able to lead through my experiences and, and loss and letting people know that, you know, it is okay not to be okay. And, you know, work hard, but also find other things that, that you're passionate about and that can drive you. That's awesome. Um, and, and that perspective, you know, I'm, uh, I'm going to put my video on right now. Tell me if, if, uh, I freeze out too much here, but, um, you know, I wrote in, in, in and there's a couple of questions that have already come in some on the board to our panelists directly. Some I've actually gotten texted from folks who are listening on, but I want to repeat that piece that both of you shared about perspective is that I really believe that perspective is, is the greatest uh, superpower that humans have. We all have it. And Natalie, like your story is, is you know, I, I, I can use my examples and I'm sure the other uh, Bob, and, Bob and Mark can use theirs, but your story is so fascinating in that, you know, saying that this is the way that I was able to connect with people before. And this was maybe one, some of the things that gave me the advantage. And people might look at me and say, poor you, right? When, when, when they look at your scar or something like that. But what you're saying is, what I lost in one way, I gained in something else. And that's so, so powerful. Like, you know, I, I can tell you from my story, and I know Bob was just very vulnerable about what might happen with sports business solutions as teams are shutting down and stuff like that, is, you know, when I was deciding whether or not I was going to go back into sports after doing that my whole life or go into this field, I could look back on that two and a half years of laying in a bed and being feeling awful and think to myself, oh, that sucks. Like I lost two and a half years of my life. I was basically like a vegetable during that two and a half years, not functioning. But what, but, and then from that, I, I lost the momentum that I was building in my sports career. One, that wasn't true. Like one, you know, sometimes you, you, you manifest those things in yourself. Like I, I won't, won't mention the league. It was like a minor league. And I got a call like right when I, I shared my story asking if I wanted to be the commissioner of this league. Right. So like, I think sometimes you you downplay yourself in terms of what you think is available to you when a loss has happened. Um, the other thing is what it what it springs board you to, and so the opportunity to get on a call like this or to build an organization like Same Here or to connect with people and share stories is not something I would ever have been able to do if not for going through that misery for that two and a half year period. And then I think to myself, oh, did it have to really be two years? Um, but, you know, uh, uh, what if I could have just done this for, for six months? Wouldn't I have got, gained the same perspective? Probably not. I, I tried over 50 different psychotropic drugs. I tried TMS therapy. I tried ECT shock therapy. These are all things that probably gave me credibility to be able to talk about all the shit that can happen to you when your mental health goes awry. And so because of that, look at what I gained from it, right? And, and I think for the four of us on this call, 
and, and questions are coming up. So maybe Bob, you, you, you read out the first question here after I'm done, but I want to acknowledge for everyone who's dealing with the pain of loss, especially as it pertains to loved ones, no one is diminishing that the grief and the, and the, the feeling of there's something that we have to mourn that that void will never be completely filled. I think all of us can acknowledge that. Like even going back to my grandfather at nine years old, that story I shared, of course, loving that, that human being, that person who's an important part of my life, that, that is something you can't fill. But what you can do is you can use the loss in a way to improve your life in other ways. And that's the best way to pay respect to the, what the loss has happened to you and to create even a better version of yourself and even a better life is to use that loss to propel you even further. So I, th I thank you guys for being so vulnerable. Bob, I know I've got a bunch of questions that have been texted in, but you got some questions there um, on the chat as well. Yeah, I mean, we can take those. The last thing that I will say, and Eric, I don't know if you want to organize the questions uh, that yeah. you've gotten on text, but you know, I think one thing that uh, I think both of you said, but Natalie, that really stuck with me was, you know, if something happens and we lose our jobs or, you know, lose something and we, we're forced to look inward and figure out like, okay, what else would we do? You know, I, I think what you said is like, um, you know, it gives you a new opportunity to learn something different or to broaden your skill set or to uh, just to become a more well-rounded person in some ways, right? It's like, um, you know, for example, if I were to, if Sports Business Solutions wasn't able to sustain long term and that meant I was not traveling as much, like the silver lining is, you know, I'm home more with my kids, you know, and so like maybe I become a better uh, partner, husband, father, um, and, you know, maybe that's a part of my life that I wouldn't have had before, you know what I mean? Or I, I would look back and maybe I would be able to do something different that was also impactful, but also have this uh, new skill I'm developing is just being a better, you know, better dad and being more present. Um, so I, I just think like that just was really powerful in that looking at it, not as a, I've lost this, but maybe changing our perspective into like, I've gained this, you know? So it's like, not, not like it, spending it in a way, if you can, as like, this could be a really positive thing and challenging us to do something different or to learn a new skill or to, or to do something out of our comfort zone, which in some ways could be re-engaging, you know, for a lot of us that have been doing the same thing for a long time. So uh, Mark and Natalie, I appreciate you both sharing that because that's super impactful. I don't know if you're listening on the call. Um, we're all going to take something different from, from this, but that's, that's super impactful for me personally. So. Bob and Eric, can I add to that really quickly? And then I think this yeah. might lead into the questions. Uh, so perspective is great, but one thing I found really powerful, if I bring it back to self-awareness, that breaking my neck and just having that thrust upon me was I found with some time an opportunity to reflect inward and, and, and hit the reset button and look at what my values were. And, and I think this is the occasion, if people haven't done it already, to also take this opportunity to check in with ourselves. And what I mean by that is, yes, we change our perspective, we look at opportunities, but really check in with, again, what's our definition of happiness? Like define that. Can people honestly say, this is what happiness means to me. And when you look at happiness, you've got to bring in that fulfillment element, not just what gives me pleasure, what fulfills me. And then step back and look at the bigger picture and think, because then I think if we do that, we can, we can apply whatever career, whatever job. But as long as we're aligned with what our values are and the value that we want to give to the world, contributions massive. And you look at, especially, I know Eric well, that is what he's doing with his life, bringing value to other people. The fulfilling piece to that way outweighs, and I think it just makes it easier to choose what you're going to do as long as you're doing what makes other people happy. And when you focus outward on other people, it eases that, that anxiety we have about our own life. Mm -hmm. so it's fascinating. It's fascinating you say that, Mark, because the, the, the question that came in on text message kind of bleeds into the question that we just got online. So it'll, it'll be a good Perfect. intersection point. The question was about how do we gain an understanding of our self-awareness? And I think you just touched on that really well, which is looking inward to say, what is it that truly makes me happy, right? Um, and, and, and 
I, I can give a firsthand acknowledgement to this, and, and I don't know that I would have realized this if, if this negative experience happened to me, was I got into sports. I think all of us have been involved in sports in different aspects, a reporter, a player, right, people in executives positions. And we got into it because we, we had this love of sport, right? But that's a me thing, isn't it? Like for each of the four of us, that's something that I am passionate about. That's something that Bob Hammer is passionate about. Natalie's a passion about, Mark's passion about. Then when you start to dive a little bit deeper, I started to look back and well, why is it that I'm enjoying helping people so much after I shared my story? Why is this bringing me so much pleasure? And the, the, um, the realization that I came to is what I actually loved about being in sports and sports business and on the management side of things was actually helping people helping people grow their careers, helping people manage through difficult situations, helping people when their personal life was in a difficult place. And what I realized was the fulfillment that I got by helping others was actually the joy that came from sports, something that I didn't even realize when I got into sports. I thought I'm going to be making in marketing and for the NBA when I'm when starting my first job, I'm going to be make, making posters about Michael Jordan and Magic Johnson. That's, that's an awesome career, right? And that's not how it works. Um, so so that, that self-awareness is what brings you joy in terms of the, the day-to-day task and, I, I, and probably not necessarily the content itself, if that's helpful, okay? So if I had to like put that into Natalie's words, it would be like maybe it's being able to communicate to people uh, the intricacies of what's happening on the field. Okay, I enjoy sharing that I'm a good verbal communicator. And so whether that's sports or something else, that would always be something that I'm excited about. In Mark's case, because I love being teammates with people and being camaraderie and around people, I love the fact of bringing people together and psyching people up and making people feel like they're part of something bigger than themselves. So it dovetails nice into this next question that we have here. And since I've talked so much, I'll leave it to you guys, though I, I, I have some of my own opinions, of course, is for those who are in sales, in sports sales specifically, who are fearing that the job might not be available to them now, or maybe the job has already gone away, and they don't know that they're going to be able to continue in sports sales specifically, what is a good plan B? And, and I think the fascinating part about this question is some of the examples that were given in terms of question marks are real estate you know, uh, insurance sales, right? And, and, and my take, and I can't wait to hear from you guys, is maybe, maybe it's not directly sales. Maybe there was something about sales that you loved and doing that soul searching that Mark was talking about. Maybe you love competition. Maybe you love helping people fulfill a need in some way, but it's not directly through sales, right? So when you, when you break down in your mind what your day-to-day was and what joy came out of it because you were able to help other people in some way and that it's not related to baseball, basketball, soccer, et cetera. And it's not related to just closing a sale, but what is the day to day of what you do and that skill set of what you love? How is that transferable to something else that opens the door way wider to more than just, I'm going to go from this type of selling to that type of selling. So, you know, Bob, I know you do this all the time with, with, with career coaching with folks. Maybe you're a good person to start off with that question. Yeah, and I, I align with you, Eric, and I want I definitely want to have Mark and, and Natalie weigh in. There's a couple more questions, and I know we're coming up against time, um, you know, but I, I've experienced this myself, you know, similarly to Eric, got getting into the sports business because I enjoyed sports, and what I realized is I enjoyed working with customers. I enjoyed helping people experience the, the live entertainment, you know, and, and as I grew my career and I got to become a manager, my passion turned to helping others succeed. You know, I loved coaching and teaching and, you know, and, and then eventually landed on the idea of doing that and leaving a steady paycheck to, to start this new business, making no money, but helping people on a bigger stage and being twice as happy. You know, I was happy where I was, but like starting this new initiative, I was engaged, I was fulfilled and it was very different than what I was doing before. And so I really agree with Eric in that, you know, it's not just the job that you're doing, but it's like, what is it about the job that you really uh, enjoy? And there's other uh, industries and fields and things in your life where you can experience that. Um, it's not necessarily just like, okay, I sold this, I'm going to go sell this. It's just what, 
what is it truly about your job that you enjoy? Uh, Natalie, Mark, I'd love you guys to weigh in too. So for me, you know, I had to go back to my why. Like, why did I get into sports journalism? And for me, that was to tell stories. I think there's something, in, and I wanted to tell sports stories specifically because I think whatever it takes for someone to make it, even as a Division One athlete, and then you consider professional athletes, there's something special that drives those people. And I thought, you know, if I can use these stories and help, you know, other people that maybe come from same similar situations as some of these athletes, maybe it can inspire them and it can provide them with hope or something else that they didn't even realize could be a dream of theirs. And so I, I saw power in sharing those stories. And so for me, when I went back to my why, it was like storytelling. I wanted to tell stories that made a difference. And I was always very good at telling stories and keeping the story on the people in front of me. But what happened with me, you realize the power in your own story. And so for me, as much as I was very good and, and still do, and, and I'm still very good at telling other people's stories, there's just an added purpose in sharing my story and seeing the impact it can make. And so I think really in, in figuring out what's next when you lose something, is going back to like you and saying, you know, what makes me happy? And I think it's also important because I loved exactly what I did, covering college football, traveling around and doing that. It was awesome. But the moments when I was happiest is when I was telling those really good stories. And so if you're able to backtrack and say, okay, what part of the job is, is fun and great, but what part fulfills me the most? And what part uh, brings me the most joy versus what part makes me the most comfortable. I think the difference between being comfortable and being fulfilled and happy can be different sometimes. Mm -hmm. And figuring out what parts of the job do serve you in, in whichever ways. Yeah, yeah. Mark, how about, how about you? Yeah, and thanks, Natalie. Yeah, you said a lot of things that I wanted to say, and I might say them in a different way. But what comes up for me now is people are asking in the Q&A about purpose and moving into what's next. I'll say a couple of things. I'm going to come back to what I said before, and that's connecting to our greater, I'm going to call it vision. And when people think vision, they might think plan, goals. But I mean truly like a broad, what is your vision for the world that you want to live in and your immediate community and then your family? But what kind of world do you want to live in? What kind of world do you want your kids to grow up in if you have kids? Uh, is it a safe world? Is it a well-educated world? Is it an emotional intelligent world? Which is my vision because I think with emotional intelligence, a lot of the stuff and the anguish and the violence and the fear out there that we see would be alleviated. Um, so I want to see that in schools. So when I connect to that vision, sit with yourself and just think about the bigger picture and then think of your place in that and the impact you can make then when it comes to those fears of moving into something else, if you get furloughed or you lose your job, you have a vision now that you can, you're can you motivated toward and that, that will help you persevere. So then take a, ment like take a stock take, take an inventory of your own strengths. Yes, look at what makes you happy and gives you joy about the particular job that you do, but then really get familiar with why you are so good at that job. And when you do that and you look at the, the skills, then you have an understanding of how they can transfer into another career or into another job. Without that self-awareness, it will feel very overwhelming and a little scary about what's next for me because you are so identified with what you've done for so long. So look at the skills and get creative with how that can apply to other jobs. One, one, uh, one thing too, and I, I will mention, I know we're at the top of the hour, so if you need to hop off, uh, you know, we understand, but I, I wanted to ask this question too, and maybe be a good one to finish with, but for people that have never gone through this exercise, Natalie and Mark uh, specifically, like how do you find your purpose, which is such a big question, like defining your why and, and what, what, you know, again, for some of us, especially those of us that are younger, maybe they've graduated college and they've had this job and they haven't really thought about the why. It's like, hey, this pays the bills. I enjoy what I'm doing. And now they might have to be thinking about, well, what does make me happy? And that's such a, such a big discussion topic and a big thought that it's sometimes scary for people a little bit. So like, do you have any practical um, you know, tidbits for someone that is gonna sit down and write out or think through like, what, what makes me happy? What's my why? 
what's my purpose? Like, how do you, how would you coach someone into finding that? Uh, I would love your, both your in, input on that. I think it starts with just getting to know yourself. And, and for people who right now don't have unfortunately jobs to go through and are sitting at home and are struggling with how am I going to get back in this business with this career and, you know, are looking for that purpose. I think turning inward and saying, um, you know, what if, like I said before, what has made me the happiest? Um, but like, really, who am I? Like, who am I, um, you know, to the people that are closest to me? Who am I to the world? And I think from, from people I've spoken to, it's just purpose starts with, um, for so many of us, through service. And so, you know, in serving in the feeling you get, you know, how can you serve maybe in a way that I can or Eric can or Mark can or Bob can? What can you add um, or serve or provide based on your experiences, your financial situation? And, and I think, you know, starting there is a great place to start. Yeah, Bob, I, the key is in exactly what you said before. And, and you, you mentioned that not many people really know. And that's because they don't ask the question. That's where it starts. And I like to, with my coaching, you mentioned that's something that's very easy to just ad adopt right now is your own little mantra could be, and it applies to many areas in life, is just get curious. Remind yourself to get curious. Get curious about yourself and what it is you want and what makes you tick and what lights your fire. Only then can it lead you to what your purpose is if you ask yourself the question. And get curious in life in general. It builds relationships. Think about building a relationship with someone else. How many people just talk about themselves, talk about themselves? They might get nervous. They just want to talk and talk and talk about themselves. Are you getting curious? Is that building trust and uh, relationship building. Only when you get curious with someone else can you learn about someone else and form a bond. So that's what I would say as a first step is get curious in all areas of your life and it will lead you to the answer that you're looking for. You know, when I, when I was younger, I used to look at, you know, people our parents age and say, why does this person donate money or go to the jello jump for leukemia or involved in the, you know, kidney foundation or whatever else it is. And then you realize it's because they've been touched with a life experience based on that. And that brings them that purpose because life kind of smacks them in the face with it. And, and what I'm hoping comes from this conversation that we're having with everyone on this call, probably younger than the four of us or similar age, is that you learn from kind of how maybe we had to have life experiences smack us in the face to get us to ask those questions and to help you start asking those questions on your own without it having to be a life experience that gets you there. I'll, I'll, I'll joke a little bit with someone in the industry that, that a lot of people know, you know, Dr. Bill Sutton um, was, was working at the NBA in Teambo when Teambo first started when I was there. And then when I started to go work for teams, um, I remember Dr. Bill just went and he went, started consulting for teams and, didn't want to go run a team like Bernie Mullen did or some of the other folks who were in the industry. And I was always like, Bill, so connected. He could get any of these jobs running any of these teams that he wants. Why isn't he doing that? Like, this is where it's at, like being at a team and, 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 and having the, the X on your back. And, and I'm not trying to downplay the fun of being at a team. So for those of you who are loving it, stay with it. And it's awesome. But I'm, I'm talking about the other flip side of it is if you look at Bill's career, what Bill loved was the opportunity and the flexibility of consulting for teams to also be able to start a sports management program at, at, at those Central Florida schools that he was at, two different ones, and, and, and to be able to, to, to use what he learned to, to help other people get better. And I think the common theme of what we're all kind of sharing here is, is the, the internal questions that we ask to try and find that purpose if we can tie it to our jobs is often different than what we think it is, which is a very unique thing to share in a group of people who are in the sports industry, all talking right now, because we think we're in this industry because we love sports. And again, I'm not, I'm not projecting a mass exodus from everyone on this call. I, you know, I, I, I loved doing it for the years that I did. And I think you all did also, but just in terms of taking the anxiety away from you all, 
I think the cool thing is there's a lot of love that exists beyond just the sport itself. And I think many of you are going to be able to find that love by, by searching inwardly. But one, one thing I wanted to, I wanted to bring up too, and just to take the other point of view here is that how does money play into this, um, Natalie and Mark, because I think sometimes people say, well, Hey, I, I have to provide, I, I can't always do something I love. Like I got to pay my bills. And, you know, I think we've, we've all been fortunate that we've been able to follow our passions and make it a career, but some people aren't that uh, fortunate, you know, like, and so how does that play in and like, maybe talk through, talk through that piece is like, how do you weigh like, you know, what's most important to me is, yeah, it's doing coaching and all of these things, but also it's, you know, providing for my family. So if you're forced to make a choice, like, how do you choose? Uh, Mark and Natalie, I'd love your, your perspective there. So I'll go. Um, so <laughs> well, for me, like I said, I got my first full-time job in journalism when I was 18. So I was very fortunate that my adult life, until I was in the hospital, I had a job 100% of the time. So I had a level of financial security, even when I felt like I was very underpaid, that I was still fortunate to have. Yeah. And so coming out of the hospital and part of my like relationship was that my ex took most of my money while I was in the hospital. And so I had to figure out like, what do I do next in terms of, I, you know, I know who I am. If, if, if I'm unable to get another job in sports journalism, because again, with mental health, people are afraid to hire people who have been through mental health struggles. Um, no matter how talented you are. So for me, um, I was able, at the time I was on disability and I was able, I said, I'm gonna live off of nothing, um, make my lifestyle very modest and build this company while I do that. And that's what I did. I, you know, I was fortunate to have some sort of income while I was doing that. But I would say to people that don't have that opportunity, I would say, you know, if you have to go out and provide for yourself, for your family, um, you know, if you're able to take a little bit of time here and there to build, you know, create that space, whether, you know, everyone has the opportunity now, you know, so if it's journalism or like sports radio or whatever it is, you know, there are podcasts, there are blogs, there are these things where you can build up your skills. And while you're working this job that may not drive you and you may not feel very much pride in the work that you do there, you know, balance that out, provide for yourself, provide for your family, but also dedicate some time into building your future and building the life that you want for yourself. Yeah, nice one, Natalie. Uh, Bob, for me, a lot of what I do is around mindset. So I'm going to strip it back again to, to square one and the building block for people is when we, money is obviously a very, very important thing. Uh, and without it, we wouldn't exist in this society. What I encourage people to do as they're pondering what's next and what about money is here's a great opportunity to check in again with your relationship with money. I think it starts there. Get curious about your relationship with money. And what I mean by that is, is do you see money as friend or foe? Do you have a scarcity mindset about money as opposed to abundance? Do you really believe that money grows on trees or do you think it's something that's really hard to come by and when I get it, I've got to hold on to it and, and really just ration it out? I think if people got honest with their relationship with money, they could find a lot of keys to then their next step on how to make it. If you really make friends with money and you see it not as this maybe evil thing or something that's really hard to come by and I need to choose this over this, then I think you're in a better position to then jump into things and then you'll know how to just make money and monetize whatever your passion is. But it starts with your relationship with money. I think a lot of people struggle and struggle and struggle with money because they don't have a good relationship with it. If that makes and Mar sense. And Mark, I think, I think to your point with the relationship with money, it's the reason I brought up the Dr. Bill example is I think we're all conditioned, especially in this industry. We graduate, we get our $25,000 or $30,000, depending on what market you live in, starting salary, and then try to earn our commissions on top of that and then try and grow the revenues on, over that. And so our thought process is revenue comes from a 
you know, office job that looks like getting in at this time and leaving at this time, and especially in sports, sometimes it's in at 7 or 6.30 in the morning and out at 1 in the morning because of games. The, the Dr. Bill example that I gave is because he was like, okay, I'm going to make a little money here by consulting with these teams. I'm going to make money here by working as an advisor towards these education folks. And by the way, it might not be that glamorous when we first start doing that, and, and working towards our purpose. So you might have to, as difficult as it sounds, work at Trader Joe's for three hours a day while you're doing the thing that Natalie's talking about, while you're building skills, learning this podcast piece, or while you're interning, or while, it, 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 what, we could, what, what hopefully you could learn from each of us in terms of, I think, where each of us have, en have ended up right now, we certainly have a long path still to go, hopefully, knock on wood, is that, what we've learned is the value of enjoying where we are and what we do is way more valuable than the, the name that's on our business card or, or, or what we're able to tell our friends or, or anything like that. And so your path towards getting there might not look as traditional as what you've done so far. Um, you know, it, it might, might be a more meandering of how do I get there but just know you're getting there with this idea of getting to a place where you could eventually be more stable. And I think to Mark's point, if you can be comfortable with being a little bit uncomfortable around money and knowing what you're, you're look, I, I, I don't have a steady income the way that I did when I worked for sports scenes. I get donations from the stuff that we do when we go and we deliver presentations to people and I'm building other revenue sources. That's not something I've ever had to do before. That's very uncomfortable for me. But if I want to continue to do something I love, that's how I have to find the ways to do that. So just break away from this idea that money and stability always comes from this 7 a.m. to 1 a.m. job that we've been working that all of us know so well. Well, Eric, to your point, it's what you're spending it on as well. You are connected to your vision and your passion of making an impact in the world and, and, and every person's life that you come across individually. So now the way you spend money changes. What's important to you changes. We yeah. struggle so much to make a certain amount of money for status and material things. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing for you, that's different now. And so I think that's what I also mean by relationship with money. What do I use it for? What does it give me? And what do I really need it for? And once that shifts, I think then things will just open up. Yeah. And go ahead, Natalie. Sorry. No, I just think Mark said something earlier about just ego when he stopped playing. And I think that was huge for me too. You hold on to something because you've built up so much clout in a space. And so at some point, I think most of us, when we achieve some level of success, we, we have this ego that is a part of it. And so humility, I feel like can help so much when you just say, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to do it for the right reasons. I'm going to do things that make me uncomfortable. And I'm determined to make this work. You know, my experience has been, that's a wonderful start. And 90% of the time, it's going to end up working for you. It may take a year, it may take two years, it may take five years. But like humility and just continue to work at what you believe in, um, that'll allow other people to continue to believe in it. Because when you're working for nothing, it's a lot easier for people to invest in your idea because you're either crazy or you're really on to something. I'm laughing as you're talking, Natalie, and smiling looking at you because I didn't know you before as a sports reporter. So when you're talking about ego, I didn't know the Natalie that had the ego about the top, you know, uh, Southern sports conference, you know, type of, type of um, uh, uh, a reporter. I would look at you now and say, Look at the ego that she has because she's built herself up and being able to be a storyteller in this space. So another key learning from what you said is just because you have ego in one thing and you like the fact that you enjoy that ego because you're good at what you do, but now you have to transition, that doesn't mean you don't get to get back to a place where you get to build ego again if that's something that's important to you and do it in a different space or a different area and a different angle because I look at you as this awesomely successful person who's telling stories after she's been through some crazy stuff, right? So, so don't think that just because your ego is in a certain area right now, it can't then go to where you build it up in another area as well. Yeah, and I think one thing I'll add to here in sort of closing is 
Um, I think some of us too, you know, maybe if you guys could weigh in on this quickly, because I don't want to go too long. Um, it's like sometimes when you deal with that loss, you, you almost fault yourself. So maybe like, it's like, what did I do wrong here? Like what I could have done this better. And you sort of beat yourself up over it. But some of these things are out of our control too. Right. So like, maybe talk through just quickly, like just the importance of giving yourself uh, space to grieve. Yes. But not letting yourself, I'm not going to say wallow. It's not the right word, but not letting yourself stay in that mindset and continue to beat yourself up over like, what could I have done differently? How could I have prevented this? Because as someone with OCD, I live my life to, to traditionally I've lived my life recently on like trying to prevent every outcome possible by checking everything that I do, which is not a healthy thing, but you know, being okay with some uncertainty and, and relinquishing some of that control is very difficult for me. And so I think sometimes when we lose, we, we look inward, like it's my fault. And so maybe talk about the importance of not letting yourself go that way. Mark, you might've, experience this when you're like, hey, maybe if I had gone right instead of going left here, maybe I wouldn't have broken my neck, you know? And I did you go through that thought in your mind and like, how could I have prevented that? Um, you, does that make sense? I don't know if that question makes sense, but like uh, maybe talk through like how that part is okay. Like let's grieve it. Let's relinquish some of that control and then we can process and move forward. It's funny you say that because the night before my game that I broke my neck, I suffered gastroenteritis. And for anyone that, basically that means stuff was coming out of both ends of me. I lost nine pounds in 24 hours. My doctor said I'm not to play, but it wasn't her call. She said, it's, it's your call. And that bravado in me, that ego, Natalie, was, was saying, screaming out saying, but I'm a leader, the team depends on me, I can do this, a very stoic approach. So. I was not meant to play that game. I ran out with only having had a piece of toast that morning before the game. And as fate would have it, that's the game I broke my neck. Now, can you imagine, yeah, the, the, the amount of time that I spent thinking, well, what if I didn't play? What if, what if? And to your point, that's again what I, what I talked about, getting better at the power of now showed me how to just be in the present moment. Whenever I ask the question, what if, I'm stuck in the past. Or the future, what if this happens? What if this doesn't happen? Now I'm living in the future, which doesn't exist. So I've got be, developed a really good relationship with, I have no control over that. I can control what I can control. So once we realize that, in fact, that was one uh, saying that was told to me by a rugby coach in my, early on in my career was control the controllables. And he said that because I had an injury that I shouldn't be playing with, but I was worried that if I didn't play, the person that replaced me would keep that spot and I'd never get back in the team. And when I finally opened up and expressed this to the coach, he just said, oh, well, you've got it all wrong. Control the controllables. You can't control if the person that replaces you plays well, but you can control not playing to make yourself a lot worse right now get better, control your rehabilitation so you get back on the field, control how much you do to be better when you do take the field so that I have no choice but to put you straight back in the team. When he phrased it like that, and I apply that to a lot of situations. So to finish up answering that question, you were saying, uh, I think kindness comes to mind as well when you're saying that. I'm a perfectionist, and I know Natalie will, will, will agree with me. And perfectionism has its upsides and, and downsides. With perfectionism comes self-beat up, for me anyway, when I don't get it right, when it's not perfect. And it has prevented me from creating so much magic in this world because I wanted to make sure it was perfect before I release it to, for other people to benefit from. And so I leave so much on the table. So what I've learned is what's important is kindness in the world in general. So be kind to other people and it will make you more fulfilled and give you more of a purpose. But you also get to be kind to yourself. So if you're beating yourself up, are you being kind to yourself? So put kindness in your life, not just for others, but yourself as well. Yeah. Great. Natalie, yeah. go ahead. As a perfectionist, as someone with OCD, that's something that, you know, I struggled with my entire life is being kind to myself. I'm very hard on myself. I've never had a boss that's hurt my feelings or 
you know, to, to a certain level because I've always thought worse or thought, challenged myself harder than anyone else could challenge me. Um, so yeah, being kind to myself, you know, I look at my staff and the people I work with and I always try to be very intentional about the feedback that I give them because I want it to be constructive, but I, I, I want it to also be like real. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and in doing that, I try to, you know, be kind, but I, I don't, I've never treated myself until now that way. And so even now when I'm doing work with my company, I'll have, you know, my team and my leadership team kind of, I'll be like, so give me some feedback. And they'll, they'll be like, it was great. It was this. And I was like, feedback. And, and, you know, for me and my, my rough translation of feedback is like, break me down so I can build myself back up. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, it, it can lead to a lot of success, but it, it's not being kind to yourself to not, when you work very hard, you should be able to celebrate your successes. And there's so much um, that can come from learning how to do that. And so I think that's just really important. And the last thing I'll say is, I mean, I'm a double minority that's worked in sports journalism. I mean, looking at you three, you all look very great, but there's something about all three of you that is very different from me. And so that has driven the pressure that I also put on myself is that I have to, I think we can carry the weight of the world on our shoulders. And so every time I did something, it wasn't just, I'm doing this and I've got to succeed for myself, but I have to succeed for people who look like me. And, and allowing yourself in, to be human and make mistakes um, is a part of the journey. And, and forgiving yourself for doing that, I think is so important because if you're in the space of just self-loathing and beating yourself up, you're not you're not helping anyone. You're not helping yourself and you're not helping the people that you want so desperately to help. Yeah. Um, super powerful. Mark and Natalie, we, we appreciate you, you coming on to do this. Um, I, uh, I'm going to wrap it up because I know we've gone a little bit long into the panelists. Thanks for sticking on an extra 20, 25 minutes. I, I should have asked if you had a hard stop. So thanks. I don't know if you had to reschedule anything, but we, it means a lot that uh, you, know, you stuck on here with us. I also wanted to say thanks to all the attendees that have stayed with us. Uh, my apologies for the technical difficulties up front, um, you know, but hopefully as we got into this conversation, everyone on here got some, um, some valuable takeaways. I know I definitely did for sure. Um, Eric, I'm sure you get something out of each time you, you have one of these, these conversations. But um, I guess before I, I say goodbye, Eric, anything you want to say in closing? No, I, I, th I think that the, um, the vulnerability shared here is one, hopefully, a, a safe space for all of you who are on to feel like you can always come back when we do these. And the growth of this will allow that safe space to continue to be open more and more so that you could continue to share. Um, and, and we want to get to a place, all of us who are collectively on this call, where as an industry, we feel this way. And, and I'm like tangentially connected to the industry still from my past, as is Natalie, as is Mark, you know, Bob's a little more directly in it. But, but this, these types of conversations, this type of sharing is what's going to do it. You know, I'll, I'll give a little plug for it on the Sports Business Solutions website, which Bob will say, there's an open forum on there to ask questions in an anonymous way on a message board. Please go in there, just like you guys ask questions just to the panelists here or texted me. Go in there and ask questions throughout the course of the week. It's there for you guys to share information with each other. And just as what Danny Fagan did in terms of putting your story out there, we give, give her a ton of credit for doing it last week. You've got the ability to share your story on our platform if you want. So, so please take advantage of that. That's no pressure. Just know that's available to you. The other thing I would say is I've noticed from the feedback, and I'm going to be very transparent about this, like Bob when he shared his story and, and Danny when she shared her story, most of the feedback, which is really positive and a lot of feedback, it comes from folks that are like manager level down to entry level. When I say down, that's a derogatory term, but in terms of where their career is progressing at this point. So it looks like this, this conversation is going to have to be a bottom-up conversation. And what that means is us at our teams, and I, I give a lot of credit to Kevin Dart from a senior level position. I know he was on for a while. I don't know if he still is, but you know, to see some people in senior level spots who, who are taking ownership of this and really want to help their team out, you guys who are on this call, guys and gals who are on this call, to be able to open these conversations 
and to be able to say to your directors, VPs above, hey, listen to this stuff that's going on. This is the stuff that we need to talk about. Even if you just get them to come and listen to a recording, that's all we're saying. And to see the vulnerability of what it does for people, that's where we need to get to because we're still at this place, especially in this industry where it stops. It stops with the people who are willing to be vulnerable here and we have to keep growing it out or else it's just going to stop there and it's just going to be this insulated group that we have. Yeah, I, I sent over the link. Um, if you have any questions, you want to be involved in some of what we're doing, you can always reach out to, to me. You could email me. You could email Eric, connect with us on LinkedIn. Natalie, Mark, I don't know if you guys are open to LinkedIn connections, but um, if they want to connect with you, are you guys okay with that? Absolutely. Um, thanks again to the panelists for doing this. I want to give one last shout out to Mandy Barefoot at the Make and Bacon who, um, you know, through our discussions had this idea for this session. And so Mandy, uh, if you're still on, we appreciate it. I thought this was one of the best ones that we've done. And this is a great uh, subject. Uh, thanks for bringing this to the table. And, and for everyone else, if you have other subjects, topics, ideas, or things that could be relevant in this space uh, that, that you're going through, please, um, please share those because we want this to be, like Eric said, a community and for us all to talk about these things in a very open, vulnerable, and just very real, authentic way. So thanks again for, for doing this. Thanks to the panelists. Um, have a great rest of the week. And I will post the recording probably within the next couple of days. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, All right. Mandy. Thanks, Natalie, Mark. Appreciate it. Thanks. Bye, guys. Bye.